Thank you, Len, for a great introduction and uh, diagnosis. I'm going to turn our attention to treatment. So my outline today is uh, just really to focus on treatment, um, and I would love to, to hear um, from the audience. We'll have a Q&A later today on uh, topics that um, are, are difficult to handle and what people think of all the new treatments that are, are coming out. Um, I also have a case. I'm not sure that we will get enough time to do that, but if we do, we would be happy to go through that case as well. So this is a quite iconic slide. I think many of us have, have seen this. Uh, really depicting the postural changes over time that we see in ankylosing spondylitis. And um, I would say it's getting uh, more difficult for me um, in terms of, uh, you know, trainees and looking at um, some of the late sequelae of ankylosing spondylitis. But this is just such a classic slide. I thought I'd bring it up and remind us why we are trying to treat earlier, why we are getting all these criteria to try to look at this disease state um, as early as possible. Um, where there might be more amenable to treatment. And this was from 1976. So as we are in many other uh, rheumatic diseases that we are looking at, such as the prototypical rheumatoid arthritis treat to target, I just wanted to remind us before we get started about the ankylosing spondylitis treat to target. So here, um, as opposed to other uh, disciplines, such as cardiology, we always have a nice treat to target what your blood pressure should be, 120 over 80, or what we think our uh, LDL should be in our cholesterol panel. But part of the reason I went into rheumatology is really to, uh, you know, go into a, a field where sometimes that's not as well uh, mar demarcated, but yet um, still very interesting to treat. So here is an, an article that came out with a treat to target um, algorithm, looking at both um, what we call remission versus low disease activity, and really just reminding us that uh, we need to monitor these on a more consistent basis, and that we do have a target in mind of sustained remission or sustained low disease um, activity, and I'll um, go into how we get um, to that. So in a typical office visit for a rheumatologist, we have many choices that we can make, right? So many of us do this day in and day out when we, we look at, um, we try to decipher a patient's symptoms. And then we'll decide whether or not we want to do imaging. And then you'll have a decision tree, whether or not. And we just talked about you know, getting um, plain x-rays versus getting an MRI. And then blood tests, whether or not a blood test might help us in a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. Or are we getting blood tests to rule out other systemic rheumatic diseases? So these are some of the typical choices that uh, we need to make as clinicians when a patient walks um, into the room uh, with um, back pain. We also want to get some past history, right? So it's not just how they're feeling today at your visit, but it's also um, whether or not we started them or their primary care started them on some NSAIDs and what their response to that, what their family history might be, and whether or not they've had prior genetic testing. Because many times they do, and that's how they end up in your office, is because they have a, 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 either a positive test or a positive ANA, and they need further evaluation. And then obviously there's these concomitant diseases that we'll be hearing about throughout our, our um, IAS summit uh, this weekend. So you're, we're also looking for additional manifestations. Did this come out out of an infection? Did they have um, other uh, concomitant comorbidities such as skin disease or uh, GI, uh, IBD disease as well? So we went through this already, just to remind us the ASAS criteria is really trying to get at diagnosing um, our patients um, as early as possible. So they give you a little spectrum, whether you have some imaging and a spa feature that Dr. Calabrese just went over, or whether you're HLA-B27 and what else do you need? You need two additional spa features in order um, to uh, make it into the bucket for, an, um, for a spondyloarthropathy. So here we'll get into treatment. Uh, so what I think is always interesting is to remind us with all these new glossy brochures that we have in our office and all the biologics that are available, really what is the first line um, evidence-based treatment that we do have um, for uh, either ankylosing spondylitis, axial form, or the peripheral uh, form? So here, it's, the first line therapy is um, a trial of, of two um, or more um, non-steroidals. And that is not just for a couple days or a week, but it's for about a month. So how many people can really keep their patients on an NSAID for a month? Is that what we normally recommend? Is that what people normally? And when they take it for a month, do they take it every day, or do they take it 
as needed. Um, so, so these are some of the guidelines that I just wanted to um, emphasize again. So there, we're really looking at not just one, but two um, non-steroidals. And then if they don't have an improvement from there is when um, we start talking about some of the um, other treatments or people that don't respond to anti-inflammatories. Um, so just going on, um, there's also other uh, treatment recommendations, um, looking at investigational therapies, which I'll go over in more detail um, as well. But just to put everything in sort of um, a, a spectrum here. So this is also to remind us that um, people who have ankylosing spondylitis come in many different flavors, right? So, so not everyone's going to come in with the classic inflammatory uh, back pain um, that we just spoke about, but there's going to be subgroups. And the two subgroups that we see in AS are going to be the predominant axial sort of subgroup where you have the more classic SI joint involvement, inflammation of the spine, the inflammatory back pain that we just talked about. And then there's also predominantly what we see now is a peripheral um, involvement, which uh, classically has more of the enthesitis. So this is very, uh, you know, uh, this is much more typical in spondyloarthropathy than in the other inflammatory arthritis that we see, such as rheumatoid arthritis, where you actually get uh, enthesial um, point changes, um, and there are um, well thought out uh, validated measures to, to measure enthesitis. The most common that I showed here is the Achilles um, tendonitis, uh, enthesitis that you can get. There's also dactylitis, so that's sort of the classic sausage fingers and sausage toes. So these are really, you know, uh, much more specific um, to the world of spondyloarthropathy than some of the other uh, inflammatory arthritis that we see. Uh, and this is uh, most in the subgroup that which I consider more of the peripheral involvement. Um, and then, of course, there's an overlap of these two that can occur. So this is a, a, a slide that I use all the time in, in teaching our fellows. Uh, I, I really like this from Nature's Review Rheumatology, really going over uh, some of the pathophysiology that's going on in the enthesitis. So everything really stems from what we call the synovial enthesilial complex, this SEC complex. And what this is, um, this, this slide really tells us a lot in a very simple way. So the first vertebrae you see is normal. And then you'll see here is the inflammatory um, part of this disease, um, and with the red here showing the corners where many of the inflammatory lesions start. And what's important now is as we go on to the next two, that this inflammation is uncoupled from the erosion and the sedensmophyte formation. So what does that mean? So we have two different processes that are going on in ankylosing spondylitis. So you have the inflammatory process, and as you can see here, that responds to the TNF. Um, inhibitors. But then we also have some other things that are going on in AS, as we know. And these are the erosive changes that you see here that have a different pathway. And then you have the bony formation or the syndesmophytes that's giving rise to those really classic uh, x-ray findings of a bamboo spine that we see when these syndesmophytes meet the adjacent um, vertebrae. And these are done by a different pathway. And so what's interesting is that as we think about treatment, we don't really have one treatment that might cover all of these, but we're really looking at uh, you know, anti-TNFs that fall into the inflammatory um, category. And then we look at the erosis and syndesmophytes. What do we have that's available um, to either halt this or to slow this process um, down? So the approved uh, anti-TNF, which I know many of, these, uh, many of you know these that are approved for ankylosing spondylitis, we are very familiar with them in the RA world. They're also good for psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing um, spondylitis and FDA approved. What is new is that now we have some sustainability. So the studies that have been started, now we have some um, you know, greater than five years um, worth of data um, now that are available. Um, and these are just some examples um, of some infliximab, etanercept, and adalimumab um, looking at um, its efficacy um, longer term um, um, after it's FDA approved. And, and overall, the message is that there's, um, there's um, some sustained um, benefit, um, good efficacy um, over time. Uh, the, uh, the extra articular manifestations, looking at the peripheral ones that I talked about in terms of enthesitis, um, dactylitis, um, um, there's also showing some promised trends um, towards some improvement in those symptoms as well. So we also talked about not just treatment, but it's not just what we use for treatment, but when do we start these treatments, right? So we had alluded to um, earlier in the talk um, looking at um, patients that fall into this back pain greater than three months, 
less than 45 years old, and we're looking at this sort of non-radiographic stage. And at what point do we consider treatment when they sound like they're going to develop ankylosing spondylitis? Should we just wait until there's an x-ray change before we start therapy, or should we start thinking about being more aggressive with these younger um, patients? So just to remind us that there is that non-radiographic stage, and I think this is the trickiest part clinically, is when somebody walks in and says, well, am I going to be like my father if my father has ankylosing spondylitis? And at what point do we want um, to introduce um, treatment um, to this younger population with, uh, sequ uh, with pre-sequelae to AS? Um, so here are some of the studies. Um, that I just highlighted a few um, looking at um, whether or not TNF makes any difference in non-radiographic um, um, axial spa. So this is ability one, uh, looking um, at uh, over 100 patients uh, with a validated measure called the, um, the, a the ASDOS, um, showing um, some positive changes. This is um, Sertralizumab on AS as well, a 24-week um, trial. Uh, they, they seem to um, have some data looking at very um, sort of early um, benefit um, within a week or two. Um, then there's also etanercept as a short trial as well, showing efficacy um, compared to placebo in both not only disease activity, but also some of the radiographic um, changes by MRI. So this is just to remind us that there are studies that are out there. Um, uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, uh, FDA approval for in the, in the pre-radiographic stage at this point. But the concept remains is that uh, early treatment, um, what does that do? And are, are we ready for early treatment for ankylosing spondylitis? Uh, some data are alluding to what we call a drug-free remission um, if patients are treated early, if we do sort of um, almost like a cancer model and really hit them hard at the beginning. Uh, and the active inflammation that's seen by MRI can also be uh, really early on um, be affected by uh, early TNF blockade. Uh, so the question also has been hypothesized whether anti-inflammatory treatment um, is really the best way to prevent um, the true ankylosing um, that can happen, and that's what um, many of the studies moving forward are focusing on. So whether early treatment affects structural damage is, is, is really where uh, we are um, doing many of our, our future studies. So how important is early um, diagnosis? Um, as, as Dr. Calabrese has shown us, the older classification criteria moving into the spectrum of the newer ones is really trying to pick up these patients earlier. Uh, as we know, x-rays are often um, normal at the beginning, uh, and there is a great delay in the diagnosis, as we, we just heard of, and whether or not um, this, this delay, we can shorten this delay and what we can do in studies moving forward to try to design studies um, to help us pick up earlier. Uh, so despite all these positive um, results that we've seen in the anti-TNFs and early treatment um, to slow down um, um, progression, we still don't have approval for non-radiographic SPA. So that still uh, remains. So best practice impact. Um, some of the challenging issues, I think, uh, is whether or not uh, what's the role of NSAIDs moving forward. As you know, there's a lot of uh, chronic issues with um, non-steroidals, as we've heard of, especially with the uh, advent of uh, a Vioxx being pulled from the market and its cardiovascular risk. So how does that pose on our patients? Um, however, NSAIDs and exercise still remain a standard of care for many patients with, um, with AS. Um, Anti-TNF agents, um, they certainly do bring um, uh, symptom yeah, um, alleviation, as we all know, in our patients. Um, but whether or not we're going to see a dramatic um, decrease in the modification of all of our radiographic changes remains to be seen. Um, Anti-TNFs do um, slow some radiographic progression. DMARDs um, that have been used in RA, which I'll talk about now, have been slowly entering into the AS uh, market, and I'll tell you what we mean by that. So the question is not which therapy, but when do we really do this, and does time really matter in that di diagnostic delay? So there are many studies looking at what predicts a good clinical response to TNF. Um, so here we see that the shorter your disease duration, the better predictor for good response. So these are um, just conclusions that I've highlighted from many different studies that I've read. Elevated CRP. Um, as well as younger age also predict a better response. Um, so patients, it seems, that have elevated CRP at the beginning of the disease, and as we know, not everybody does, but those patients do seem to be um, good um, responders. 
Um, TNF blockade alone in, in the management of AS, I just broke it down by disease duration just to give us a sense of how much uh, we're thinking about improvement. So here you see if, if you're treating somebody less than three years of AS versus somebody with greater than 10 years, what is their BASDI score? So you can see the earlier treatment is up by um, over 80%. Um, well, if you um, are progressing and not on any anti-TNF until after greater than 10 years, you have about a 14 chance of ach achieving the same BASDI score. So what are we looking at in the future? Uh, we all know that TNFs do work very well um, in, in, the, in our diseases. Uh, but unfortunately, about 20 to 40 percent of patients um, still may not respond adequately. Uh, bony inflammation, as we see in MR, since we're ordering more and more um, MRs, um, we, we are able to compare um, people on TNF and not on TNF, and, and when can they stop on TNF. And we do see that um, we can reduce inflammation up to 70 percent. However, you know, there's still a great demand for our patients, um, for those who don't respond to TNF, um, and what else we can do um, for um, for this group. So some of the newer therapies are uh, used to kinemab, which many of you may be familiar in the derm world because you've been using this for psoriasis. There are some early trials now in ankylosing spondylitis. Aprimolas, which was just FDA approved for psoriatic arthritis, not psoriasis, is also in phase three. Um, Secacunumab and tofacitinab, which um, you may be um, familiar with in the RA um, world, is also um, gaining some traction in some early phase two studies for ankylosing spondylitis. So in summary, we really, um, we're really trying to identify early um, disease state. Uh, the new ACES criteria is a big jump for that. Um, the use of MRI and how we interpret that is important. Early treatment for ankylosing spondylitis, um, what we're trying to do is reduce that time for uh, diagnosis and whether or not treatment can really be um, enhanced in the pre-radiographic um, stage. So we know TNF blockade is good. Um, it does help, um, it, and it can slow down um, radiographic progression, but whether or not it can really change bone formation um, is sort of the next um, stage. Thank you.